Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. I have with me today a very special guest named Chuck Ferrara. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Guy. It's good to be uh, chatting with you today. So you are an artist. Um, if I can put it or I can uh, put you in a, in a box, is uh, you are a realist maybe even a, a hyper-realist artist. I, I try to be. Mm. So can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Because I, from what I gathered so far, it is very, your life is very interesting, very uh, diverse and uh, uh, adventurous in many ways. <laughs> So can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your experience? And... Well, I was born and raised in uh, Brooklyn, New York, in the city of New York. Um, I always had a love for art since I was a little kid. Uh, in fact, when I was 10 years old, I talked my parents into enrolling me in a home study course that was actually run by Norman Rockwell out of Connecticut. Wow. Called the famous, famous art school. And it really cost my parents a good penny, but they did it for me and I enjoyed it thoroughly. I used to draw in class, which made me popular with uh, the kids until I got caught by one of my teachers uh, drawing a caricature of her, which she didn't really appreciate. <laughs> And that ended my art career in school. Um, at a very early age, uh, I joined the military, active duty. I went away for three years. Uh, and when I came back under the GI Bill, which veterans can, uh, can actually uh, go to school and paid by Uncle Sam, I enrolled in a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, wanting to be an illustrator. I did that for two years, but then the New York City Police Department called me and I always wanted to be a police officer. So uh, I put my art studies on hold and switched my major to criminal justice. And it remained dormant for a very, very long time. That's a thumbnail sketch. Yeah, the thumbnail sketch. So let's uh, get into the meat of the... Uh, conversation. Well, uh, maybe it's an appetizer. Um, wh what is your, uh, what is your affinity to, to art? Where is this, where did it come from? Or you, if you, if you know, if you have some, some kind of a neurological uh, makeup that, that is conducive to art? Well, I always appreciated art since I was a child, as I said before. It was sort of innate. It wasn't like anybody in my family was artistic. It wasn't like anybody in my family was promoting art or my parents didn't take me to museums. Uh, I used to seek that out on my own. I wanted to go to the Met and, and other, the Guggenheim and other museums. So I always had this, uh, this desire to draw, to paint, to appreciate art, whether it was Michelangelo or Caravaggio, it doesn't matter, Rembrandt. Uh, I always had this attraction. My, my nephew, who's 12 years younger than me, used to sit next to me and draw with me. And today he still draws. So he always uh, thanks me for getting him interested in art. So I had an effect on someone else, but I honestly can't say that anybody had an impact that led me in that direction. It was more innate than anything else. Yeah. Um, so your art seems to be very influenced by, I don't know, may maybe uh, <coughs> the early, uh, Freddy's uh, originalistic style in America, maybe uh, Edward Hopper and uh, 
um, Norman Norman Rockwell and uh, the likes. Um, how do you get inspired artistically? Because I see that a lot of your art, I don't know if to categorize it as uh, patriotic, maybe, maybe uh, um, maybe um, maybe more, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe patriotic. I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, <laughs> out of words, I, I guess, so. Yeah, you know, my past uh, really bleeds into my present. Uh, of course, I like to do military related paintings. Uh, I know you served as well in the yes. uh, IDF. So thank you for your service. I want to thank uh, you for your service, actually, yeah. Uh, so, you know, sometimes I want to paint something that reflects that. A lot of my passion is cityscape paintings of mostly New York because that's, that's where I grew up. That's the city I love. And uh, it's the city where I cut my teeth on life. And, uh, and so my past informs my present, if you will. And, and I'll always have a love for, for my beloved city of, uh, of New York. So a lot of my paintings reflect that. Yeah, New York, yeah. Uh yeah, yeah, New York. <laughs> New York, New York. Let me hear you say, forget about it. <laughs> forget about it. Forget there you it. go, you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm good with accents, actually, yeah. I have a <laughs> wide array of accents. Most of them, yeah, very uh, colonialistic and racist, maybe, in some <laughs> ways. <laughs> maybe stereotypical, <laughs> but I think... I think they do the job when they when they have to. We don't have the the same uh, re restraints in Israel when talking about political correctness. It's it's the wild wild west in a, in a, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, <clears throat> so can you talk a, a little bit about your military uh, experience? How that how that bleeds into your art. Um, do you feel that you have um, improved uh, artistically or you always had the same uh, structure and the same techniques to making art? Well, I'll get back to your first question. Um, I'm always trying to improve. I watch a lot of videos. I do a lot of online courses study from some accomplished artists. You know, with the internet, you don't have to leave your home to go to school, which I really like. And so I pick up things uh, on a daily basis. I take a sketchbook everywhere I go. Uh, my wife loves to shop. So I'm usually that uh, German shepherd waiting outside the store. So I like to uh, sketch people in action, try to capture it very quickly, or maybe a building, architecture, uh, vehicles. I sit in my car a lot waiting for her to come out. Uh, <laughs> as far as military, um, I was in the Airborne Corps, if you will, uh, paratroopers and uh, special forces, and so, um, I have a, uh, a deep love for the airborne. And so I like doing paintings that uh, reflect that. Uh, you know, we have the United States Army, but we always felt that we were the best in that army. And so uh, I love reflecting that in my, in, my, in my artwork when I feel so inspired. I haven't done one in a while, but uh, I'll post on uh, Facebook sites where I have fellow airborne buddies and they'll all enjoy my paintings and thank me for, you know, putting something like that together. So uh, as far as the military, uh, 
I'll go back to that once in a while. Uh, I love doing uh, police related uh, paintings with police cars or police officers, uh, working in the city. The city is very different right now since the pandemic uh, in New York City. It's very quiet. A lot of stores have gone out of business. Uh, Times Square is nothing like it used to be uh, two years ago. Uh, I'm saddened over that. I hope we come back to life again, but uh, it's a very different city. So, uh, but I love painting scenes of uh, Manhattan, especially. There's a pulse there that, uh, that is off the charts. I mean, when you could get a slice of pizza at three o'clock in the morning, Hey, that's a great place. You can get a donut. Uh, donut, yeah. Well, if you're a cop, you get a donut. Yes. Yeah. I, I was wondering when when did that that like stigma started that police officers and donut shops and I don't know <laughs> uh, diving bars and the movies. Yeah. Yeah, you know. I think years ago, they would spot cops coming out of uh, donut shops, going into their squad cars with uh, donuts and coffee, and the stigma stuck. Uh, I myself, I hate donuts, so I, I guess I don't fit in that category. <laughs> uh, but you like I like falafels. Oh, you like bagels. Falafels is, you know, it's a, a dodgy dodgy area it's not exactly uh it's not it's not a i don't know if it's a it's a jewish recipe or a israeli it's a it's a, a dodgy subject yeah it's a controversial yeah yeah it tastes good though <laughs> yeah it tastes good and they offer it to you in every falafel stand that you come to here in israel they do not uh, charge for the first uh, falafel uh, ball, as we say. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's something there's something that is very much uh, it became uh, Israeli uh, in the the falafel dish. So, what are the what are the archetypes the the cultural archetypes that you are trying to capture in, in your art? I try to capture a, a snapshot of life in New York. Whether I go back in time, I did a, you mentioned uh, Hopper, I, I, I love his work. Uh, I did a scene of a street that I grew up on in Brooklyn. And I put all the stores, they weren't all in one place. I placed them all next to each other, whether it was a grocery or a deli or a pet shop or a, a diner. Uh, my brother got a kick out of that because he said they weren't all on that same street. I said, no, but a artistic license. Mm. And, uh, and I reminisced my childhood growing up. So I get great joy in that, that you could actually create something um, that'll bring back some good fond memories. Uh, oh, I try to capture a, an action scene in New York, hustle and bustle, people, uh, police officers, taxi cabs. Uh, and, and so it brings the light to people that view it. Uh, people tell me they, they've had flashbacks, my, my, my greatest uh, admirer is my wife and my brother. <laughs> but they, uh, that's what I try to capture. I, I love cityscapes. My wife sometimes says, well, why don't you paint a beach or a, a, a landscape in the country? I said, that really doesn't float my boat. I says, I like cityscapes and buildings, architecture. Yeah, you so, like raw concrete. Yeah, <laughs> raw concrete, the concrete jungle. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I think maybe your your art is trying to express some kind of ideal, an idyllic 
um, no nostalgic New York, perhaps. But uh, I gather from your art, there, there isn't much, uh, sorry, there isn't much conflict with uh, social uh, issues that art seems to always bring to the to the to the front of the uh, front of the discussion or to uh, expose the public to cultural and social social problems like like crime and uh, uh, OD uh, for uh, the black neighborhoods and stuff like this. So, what do you think about that that question that art should strive to be a kind of social and cultural movement for good or for change or although I don't like to use those terms I'm, I'm sure you don't too because you want to see the real real action being taken and not just the pretty words <laughs> You know, that's a very good point, Guy. Um, I think artists down through the centuries, many of them were on the cutting edge of, let's say, social justice issues and uh, the dark side of culture, if you will. There's no doubt about it. I clean up my art. It's, it's idyllic uh, uh, imageries of New York City because, you know, for years, I lived in the dark side of New York as a police officer. I saw the ODs, the homicides, the uh, drug abuse, the robberies. <clears throat> and uh, it's never crossed my mind to depict that in my art. And so uh, my art is a clean up version of New York City. No crime, no hardship, no uh, prejudice. And, but uh, artists usually leave small clues for the yeah. the, the the watcher, the, the viewer, to to pick up on, and they are yeah. very very subtle in a very low frequency. But you don't seem to do even that. It's right. completely perfect packaged uh, plastic buildings, shiny, colorful stuck together in the, the jungle, the hustle and bustle, and you don't see the, the movement of the city. It's a, it's a frozen in time place that doesn't, doesn't exist, actually. Why, why do you think that, why do you think that is, that you want to capture something monumentous and view it in the best way and the, in the greatest form and the clean, cleanest lines and the uh, color palettes? Well, I do love color. Uh, I love to pop red and yellow and those bright colors. I, I do enjoy uh, making my paintings vibrant. Uh, I have no reason other than I like doing that. Uh, you've given me a tremendous challenge, you know, Guy. <laughs> um, I, I agree with your summation. Um, I, I agree with what you're saying. I'm gonna to have to put some subtle, uh, <laughs> maybe a homeless person in a cardboard box in front of the store. Yeah, you know, you don't see the box, you don't see the homeless person. You just see the shadow of a shadow. Yeah. You see, you, yeah. you see the doubt. There is certainty in ideals, but you have to see yeah. the doubt. That something that is not is not real, something is uh, missing. You know, there is there is the 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 age old discussion about uh, the suffering artist trying to uh, express themselves, not being able to be heard or understood. Have you ever felt like that? I don't think I've ever had a Van Gogh moment. Uh, I think I still have both of my ears. <laughs> um, you know, 
your insight is real cha challenging to me right now that uh, you, you're absolutely correct. I'm painting in many ways, it's a snapshot of a frozen city actually, um, a moment in time that that is missing the reality of what it means to live in an urban setting. Uh, I'm gonna have to think that one through. You've got my uh, got my <laughs> mind going around in circles right now, Guy. I apologize, I apologize. No, no, it's good. I, I love challenges. Yeah, that's great, that's wonderful. That's what uh, art uh, strives to do, to challenge the human mind and its uh, yes. capabilities, you know? Um, so do you think that, sorry, um, do you think that there is, um, there's any uh, importance uh, to art, that art reflects reflects something because art is not real. Well, there are, most people don't know that. They think if they, if they re read a book and there's a story and you say, wow, th this is a real story. They see a movie and they see the blood spewing on the screen and you say, wow, that is terrifying. That is uh, tragic. They, they hear some piece of music and they say, this is a, this is a great uh, uh, elevated, I'm elated. This music is uh, causing me so much, uh, so, mu so much happiness or, so, or, or making me so sad. Um, so, do you think that art has some kind of impact on on life itself? Do you think that it's it crosses the boundaries of of its existence into our reality? Well, you know, I was thinking. I mentioned Norman Rockwell a little while ago. He captured the finer moments of life, right? I mean, it was there was never a sad moment. It was always grandma praying over uh, a meal, uh, a Thanksgiving setting, uh, <clears throat> a soldier returning from war, uh, jubilation. Uh, yes. And I guess that has influenced me in many ways. Uh, and that's the point that you're making earlier uh, there was never tragedy in Rockwell's illustrations, right? So sort of like a, a Walt Disney, uh, everything's got to be fun and joyous and perfect. Um, but I, I believe if you look at the masters, uh, many of them portrayed the reality of life that they were going through in Holland or uh, I, you know, I can't think of his name now, but I have a book upstairs and it, you're an art history guy. Yes. Uh, uh, he, he is a Jewish artist mm -hmm. who painted uh, uh, various illustrations that made fun of Hitler and, uh, and the Nazis. And mm -hmm. in fact, uh, he, he immigrated to the United States and he was so influential and irritated that regime. I think that, I know, I think I know what you, you're talking about. I think it's uh, Ben Shana, I think. Ben Shana? If I'm not mistaken, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I have the book upstairs. I read it quite a while ago. But you want to talk about somebody who in real time was able to speak truth to power in that moment through his artistic, uh, uh, you know, skill. And, and I believe art has a place in that as well. Um, uh, I think I've been terribly influenced by, uh, by Norman Rockwell. <laughs> uh, 
So maybe I need to, you know, I have so many experiences, uh, the, the, the sad side of life in New York. Uh, I've seen more than most uh, civilians see over my time in the police department. So I know what the reality of the city is, uh, but I've never reflected that in any of my paintings. Uh, so maybe there's a voice that needs to be heard. I don't know. Yeah, um, um, I'm not. I'm not criticizing you. I, I'm no. not. I'm not preaching. I'm just uh, trying to to make the argument that maybe maybe art has some influence on on life, or it, or maybe it should have some. Um, yeah. Or it wouldn't have a, it wouldn't have a right to to exist, even though it doesn't exist. Art is not real. I don't think that people understand that. Art art is not real. It, it will never be real. But um, but it has enough uh, connective links to life that you, you start to believe that it's real, that it imitates life. So can you speak a little bit about your, about your, your work specifically about um, how do you uh, choose uh, the location? Why, why, are some, uh, why are some scenes and landscapes are more more uh, pertinent to you as opposed to another artist who lives and works in New York and chooses to bring about um, different sides of, of the city, of existence, of humanity, or, or anything to, to that effect. Well, Guy, I love walking. So uh, I don't like uh, taking an Uber or a taxi. So a lot of times what I'll do is uh, I'll take the train into Manhattan and I'll get out at Penn Station and I'll just walk the streets and uh, do a lot of photographs, uh, try to capture uh, something that catches my eye. It could be a fire engine, it could be a police car, it could be uh, uh, a cafe, uh, and, you know, a storefront that I find very interesting. Um, and so beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So if I think something's attractive, then I think it's worthy of me to paint. Somebody else might say, you know what, that's just an Italian restaurant, you know, uh, I did a painting of Ferrara's, which is a pastry shop in Manhattan, very famous, and it's my namesake. So I said, you know what, I'll do that. Uh, it's, I don't know. I, I think it's whatever captures my eye that I feel, do I want to invest my time sitting down and putting all this detail and energy into a painting I have to enjoy it. It has to bring personal satisfaction. Whether somebody likes it or somebody wants to buy it, that's not important to me. If I get in front of the easel, I want to be able to enjoy it. It's got to be an enjoyable experience. And so, so that's how I choose my, uh, my, my images, if you will. Yeah. So we talked about you as a military person. So we'll move on to something that I think it's a, more interesting to me, I think. Uh, military can be a very interesting subject to d delve into, but uh, I think the police work is, is much more, uh, has much more uh, wide crit critical reception, if I can say that, and in the minds and the, uh, and the populace. So I am also, uh, <laughs> I'm 
uh, also uh, I got the bug, the bug of uh, police uh, investigations and CSI and uh, cr criminal minds and all that. And it's not, it's not real. <laughs> Even though you want it to be like that, that, there is a poetic justice in this world, but it's not. Um, how do you categorize your, uh, how do you think about your, uh, your work, your career as a police officer, and how that does that bleed into your art, into your thinking about uh, uh, conjuring up uh, idyllic images? Well, you know, Guy, I had, as a kid, there were a few things I wanted to uh, check off in my bucket list. Uh, I wanted to be an illustrator at a very early age. I wanted to be a paratrooper. My father was... Uh, in the army for many years. He served in World War II in Northern Italy. He was in the Korean War. So he had an impact on me as far as military and my brother. So we both went into service very early. Uh, and my third item in my bucket list was I always wanted to be a police officer. So when the police department finally called me and as I said, I was in a Bachelor of Fine Arts program and enjoying it. My second year, um, I left school to go into the academy in Manhattan. A very interesting thing happened when I announced to my classmates, I was two years older than all of these kids, but I was like 38 years old maturity wise because of <laughs> the military and life experience. These kids were sort of wet behind the ears. There was an African-American student, uh, Cheryl Foster, and she was almost in tears. And she said, Chuck, don't take that job. And I said, why? Her brother was killed in the NYPD, Gregory Foster. And uh, he was assassinated, actually, by a very radical group. And she said, I don't, I don't want you to be in danger. Stay in the program. Well, I left. I joined uh, the NYPD. I went through the academy. Uh, and I had a wonderful experience my entire career. I regret dropping out of the BFA program because I don't think the NYPD appreciated my criminal justice degree. It meant nothing to them. But uh, I had a, a vast experience in the police department. There were 40,000 police officers, so you could move around. So I was on patrol, I was in the tactical unit, I was in narcotics. And, um, and so I got to see a lot of different aspects of investigations. I was a supervisor of 26 undercover uh, plainclothes officers called anti-crime, which de Blasio uh, did away with. Uh, I had an anti-crime unit, Midtown South. We handled robberies, primarily only street robberies, um, uh, muggings of tourists. And, you know, uh, we rode around in yellow cabs, two guys in the mm -hmm. back, one guy driving the taxi. Uh, so I had so many great experiences and I've, I've seen so much tragedy. Uh, in New York. Um, I love the city. I, I was called by two police departments in the suburbs making twice the salary of a New York City cop. And I turned it down because I love New York. And that's not a cliche. I actually love New York. So, you know, I have no regrets having served in the New York City Police Department. And so as you see in many of my paintings, I include the NYPD. And a lot of times I put a precinct that I served in like Midtown South, which covers the Midtown area, the Lower East Side, 
Uh, I primarily worked in Manhattan in the Bronx, except for when I was in narcotics, I worked Brooklyn. So that's why you see so many cityscapes that I do. Yeah, um, that is fascinating for me. I'm so uh, remote and so uh, culturally and geographically remote from such a, uh, this uh, iconic place in uh, New York, the most uh, filmed uh, city in the world, one of the most uh, uh, wealthiest in, in uh, some uh, areas and in other areas, not so much. Um, but yeah, it's such an, there is, a, it's like there are concentric circles emanating from Manhattan and Brooklyn and Staten Island all the way and spread across the world. And, uh, you know, talking about like, uh, um, <clears throat> what's her name? Uh, Lazar Emma Lazarus's, uh, poem. Give me your downtrodden and your poor. Um, mm -hmm. It has a different. It has a monumental, monumentally different meaning than any other uh, place in the world. Yeah. You know, guy. The when I grew up in New York, there were all these different ethnic neighborhoods. You know, uh, my grandparents immigrated from Italy and there was the Italian section and there was the Polish section yeah, and the forget Jewish Forget about it. Forget about it. You know, you can get a calzone at uh, two o'clock <laughs> in the morning. Uh, it was such an interesting place. You, you could run through the alleyways and smell uh, Puerto Rican food, uh, rice and beans and gondoles and you know, it's, it was just, in many ways, it was a, a, a launching site for people to begin their lives and then maybe move to Florida or California or wherever. Many have moved to Israel. Uh, many of my friends on Facebook are New Yorkers who now live in Israel, uh, but they'll always tell me New York's always here in my heart. You know, it's it's where, again, where I cut my teeth on life. So we talked about you as a military paratrooper and we moved on to talking about the NYPD and police and talking about art in general. So now we g get to our uh, final destination in our conversation. And it's talking about something that, something completely different, like the Monty Python uh, <laughs> yes. saying. Um, uh, you are uh, an ordained uh, priest or a pastor or a reverend. They didn't ex exactly catch your title. Um, so do you want to talk about a little bit about you as a, as a leader of a congregation, essentially? Sure. And your life as a, as a holy, holy, holy person, yeah. Well, I, I don't know if I want to claim that title, holy, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> a man of faith, if you will, but yeah. uh, I was in the police department and my wife's pastor asked me to assist with the youth. And the youth, especially the boys, they were very intrigued that I was a cop and, you know, they, they watched all the cop stories and movies and, and I was able to do a good job working with these kids and I enjoyed it very much. And then one day, uh, several years later, he said to me, you know, I think you have a call on your life. I, I think you would do well as a pastor. And I said, me? Uh, he said, yeah, you. And it was sort of like a Jonah moment. You know, I ran from it as far as I could. 
until the whale spit me out on the uh, on the shoreline. I said, you know, uh, I, it never crossed my mind in a million years that I would be a pastor. Well, I felt the call. And then as I shared earlier, uh, my last year in the police department, I inquired at several seminaries and I was accepted to one. I talked it over with my wife. Uh, she felt that it was real. And off we went, we grabbed our two kids and shot off to seminary and uh, studied there for three years, got my master of divinity degree, was ordained in the United Methodist Church and then started serving churches uh, in New York and, uh, and Connecticut. They move you around a lot. Yeah, they're, they're not too far apart, New York and no. Connecticut, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So have you had any holy, uh, holy divine inspiration that uh, infuses your being with, with the Holy Spirit that lets you, lets your hand, uh, let, that guides your hand in, in paint, painting? Is there something... Do you think about uh, wanting to do uh, religious themes in your paintings and your art? You know, I haven't, uh, but I certainly feel as a result of faith, I feel very centered. Uh, I feel very at peace with who I am and where I am. That helps in the artistic process. My head's not cluttered uh, with a lot of junk. Uh, I started to go in the opposite direction during the riots and seeing my brother and sister police officers being sprayed with water and assaulted. And, and, and I realized that watching too much news was disrupting my centeredness and faith. And so I only watch news one hour a day now. That's it. That's my vitamin for the day. I want to know what's going on in the world. Um, to be informed. But uh, I found out with the pandemic, I was starting to be addicted to the news, which, uh, which took me off center. And uh, so as far as the the Holy Spirit uh, guiding me, unlike, uh, uh, unlike the writing of Holy Scripture, uh, I, don't, I don't sense that the Spirit is guiding my hand as much as it's giving me a peace. My, my easel and this little space here that my wife has allowed me to have, this is my man cave here. Um, I'm in my happy place. So I'll put on some sometimes spiritual music, sometimes classical music, and sometimes I'll blast rock and roll. Uh, my faith just keeps me in a good, a good frame of mind, a good frame of spirit. And so it inspires me that way. So... <clears throat> Is there, um, is there any religious doctrine that you, you uphold that you then try to convey in your, your, uh, in your sermons or, your, or in your preaching to the congregation? Is there... Is there a final uh, bottom line, a message that you want to, to, to convey? Is it, is it complicated? Is it straightforward and uh, moralistic? Well, if you ever get a chance, go on our church's website. My messages are all posted. <laughs> I like to guy preach life application messages not highfalutin uh, doctrinal messages. 
I don't want, to, uh, they're not interested in Bultmann and Moltmann and Karl Barth and uh, they're interested in how can I live my life in this complicated society in which I live. So if I had to hone it down, it's basically gets to love God and love others, right? And if you could live by that standard, uh, you'll make your world a better place. You know, influence your family first and then your neighbor. A friend of mine uh, who is from Colombia, uh, South America, he has a rather large church there. And one of his uh, members came to him and said, I wanna be a missionary. And uh, the pastor asked him, have you shown love and have you spread goodwill to your neighbor down the street? And he said, no. He said, well, stop being a missionary where you live first and then worry about spreading the love of God beyond the borders of your home. But my messages are always, uh, as I said, life application guy, you know, um, how do we experience peace when there's so much turmoil? And uh, so I tried to get them to a place of peace because I think we're all searching for that. If you, if you, you know, I could go to Macy's, a department store and buy a Rolex watch and I'll be happy for like a month. And then what's the next thing, a car, a house? I want to be able to have peace where I'm at with what I have. And so my congregation tells me when they leave, they said, who spoke to you today about me? You know, it, it spoke to them. And, and one thing I always tell my congregation, when I point my finger at you, there's four fingers pointed back at me. Every message I preach is preached to me as well. I'm not above any of you out there. I'm just a shepherd, but uh, I'm not above you. I'm, I'm in the flock. Well, I want to thank you so much for this interesting and enlivening conversation that we had. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. It was great being with you, my friend. Um, yeah, it was great talking to you, too. Uh, thank you for watching the episode and we'll see you when we see you. Bye.